Hey everyone, it's Patch 3.23 Affliction, and today I want to talk about the build that you're going to absolutely fall in love with. Today we're going to be talking about Self Ignite Chieftain. This is a build that I ended up playing in Ancestor, and I absolutely fell in love with it. I'm really sad I didn't get a chance to make a build guide for it. I'm really sad I only got to play it for a few days before dismantling it, but here in Affliction, we are now going to go into a full deep dive on this build. And I'm going to show you how to put it together and how you are going to enjoy blowing up the screen. As you can see in all this B-roll, this build is just glorious. It just deletes everything on the screen. It's fast. It's aggressive. And it effectively pretty much will never die to most things. This build has a insane amount of innate tankiness simply because this build doesn't really need anything to do damage. This build kind of like DD scales off of the enemy's life. So the harder the map, the more damage it does, realistically not caring about any sort of mods or difficulty on the map in terms of being able to do its damage, other than I guess reflect. This build is absolutely great for delirium mirror farming, which is the shiny mechanic for this build. It's also really good at legion farming and with a few changes, you can make it an absolute insane legion farmer. But the majority of what you're gonna want to do this is high density mapping. You can do some alchemical strategies with this as well. You can do things like harvest or expedition as well, but this build is going to absolutely shine at deleting maps really quickly. Another thing to mention is it can be a potential magic finder. You can turn this into a magic finder and I will have a separate guide on that. That, as there is quite a few changes you'd want to make to make the magic finding version comfy but this is a viable magic finder and it can do 100% delirious maps it can do anything else every other magic finder can do the only downside is it would have a little bit less magic find but overall it'd be just as fast as the normal version of the build and it is an absolute monster to do some maps with I've done quite a lot of different mapping with this over the past few days, getting ready to write this guide, and I've had an absolute blast. So let's show you how you can put this together and how you can enjoy the build as well. So the first thing I want to talk about, as always, is going to be the notes section. I implore you to look through the notes section of this build. I have put a lot in time and effort to make sure the notes section are as accurate and as precise as possible. There's a lot of information in these notes. And if you have any questions on anything, if you have any questions on any of the gear or how some of the mechanics work for this build, I please ask you to look through everything in the notes section to see if any of your questions are answered here. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is going to be how to level this build. This is not going to be a cheap build to start. It's going to cost you somewhere around 20 to 30 div, depending on the popularity of some of the items for this build, as this build will get very popular very quickly. With that being said, and because you are going to have to put at minimum 20 to 30 div, but realistically it would be better to put 40 to 50 div into this build, I'm going to assume you're going to be able to have 100 chaos to be able to level with Twink Gear all the way up to level 70. Because of that, the way you're going to be leveling this character and is mentioned in the note sections is I would recommend for you to follow Tai Tai's guide. This will be linked in the description below. It's also in the note section, but if you just level with Tai Tai's hollow palm guide, it will be the fastest way for you to level all the way until maps. And then from there, you can start playing this build at around level 70. The minimum is level 60 as that's when you can put on the weapon, which is required for this build. But I would recommend to wait until 70 to make it feel a little bit better. That does mean you are going to level hollow palm and then you have to do a respec. So it will cost you a few regrets to do that, but there really isn't any other better way of doing this. Another thing to mention is if you really want to play this build immediately, I would recommend to get yourself some 5A carries and maybe go all the way to level 90, which is kind of quick. And then you'll be able to get into playing this build immediately, but this build can be self-leveled. Currently, I am level 95 with this build by just self-leveling all the way from level 60 to 95. And that only took me two hours to do doing nothing but Delirium here as this build can almost walk into tier 16 immediately at level 60. It's kind of crazy. Moving on next, I want to talk a little bit more about this build. And I want to put this right at the front of the video on how exactly is this build going to kill anything? So the whole premises of our build is going to be very simple. We're going to be working with the weapon called the Fulcrum. And we're going to be working with a really, really broken and overpowered node called Fan the Flames. The whole point of our build is that we are a Chieftain. And with Chieftain, we get access to Hinakora's Death Fury. This gives us a 5% chance when we kill something that it'll explode, dealing 500% of the maximum life as fired damage. That's a very large number. What we're doing with that is we are getting ourselves 100% chance to ignite through some various points in our tree. And with that, that means when the explosion happens, we are going to make a very large ignite on everything that gets hit by the explosion. What we are then going to do is we're going to take the fulcrum and the role that we really care about here is the elemental ailments you inflict are reflected to you. That means those massive ignites from the explosion will then be applied onto us. The problem is that would kill us in half a second, but because we have Tesalio, we are unaffected by the Ignite. The Ignite will still remain on us, it'll exist on us, but it won't do anything, meaning we won't immediately die to it. Then, because we have an Ignite on us, 
We can then use fan the flames to spread the ignites to other enemies. Fan the flames specifically says ignites you inflict spread to other enemies. It does not care if the ignite is specifically on you. You still inflicted it even though it was only reflected to you. Meaning you basically become a walking ignite dispensary. And as long as you're walking forward, those ignites are going to kill more monsters. Those monsters are then going to explode, triggering more Hinakoras. Those Hinakoras are then going to be reflected back to you through Fulcrum. And then you're just going to keep having a massive ignite on you, which is going to kill everything around you. Now, what might happen is you might run out of juice if you don't have enough monsters around you to continuously keep killing. And if that happens, we do have a five linked fire trap and a righteous fire, which does a little bit of damage, which will help you get a kill or two to be able to proc another explosion and keep going. But realistically, if you're doing delirium mirror or in any, any sort of high density mapping with this, you will have no problem consistently getting these explosions, especially since we are stacking a little bit of ignite duration, both through the nodes here and through cloak of flame, meaning the ignite will last about 10 seconds on you, giving you plenty of leeway to be able to continuously get more kills. The really quick and dirty TLDR of how this build is going to be played is just walk into the map, press fire trap, kill a monster, monster's gonna go boom, Hinakora is gonna make an ignite that's gonna be applied to you, walk forward, the map just dies as you walk forward. And all of that should lead us directly into talking about the Ascendancy. So we are playing a Chieftain. As I mentioned, Hinakora's Death Fury is a crucial portion of this build and we absolutely need it to make this work, as well as Tassalio giving us Unafflicted by Ignite, making it substantially easier to get this build going. Otherwise, we'd be playing this as an Elementalist and fixing this, getting the Unafflicted by Ignite, is very difficult on Elementalist, using up quite a big portion of our budget, making Chieftain overall better. The other nice thing about Chieftain is we get Velocco Storm's Embrace, which basically is a melding of the flesh, giving us the same amount of maximum cold and lightning resistance as our fire resistance. And as you can see, we'll be at 90, 90, 90, which is going to make us feel really tanky, especially since we're going to be converting most of the physical damage we take into elemental damage, keeping us very tanky even with just 10,000 armor. Lastly, we're going to be picking up Ramako Sun's Light, which is the meme node of Chieftain, which gives us 20% increased damage over time against any enemy while we're stationary. And this really is not going to be used in many places other than the map bosses where we don't really have anything to do other than stand next to the map boss anyways so you might as well take it for a little bit of extra damage in that case Moving on next, I want to talk about the Ascendancy, and this is incredibly important. You do not want to skip this. If you mess this up, your character is going to be bricked and you are going to actually have to start a new character. What I want to talk to you about is going to be Soul the Brine King. This build is going to use a reverse chill mechanic where we want to chill ourselves and those chills are going to give us increased action speed through Winter Weave. Because of that, if you ever were to actually upgrade your Brine King to the 50% reduced effective chill on you, you are effectively losing a large portion of your movement speed to the point where it's actually worth it for you to re-roll into a new chieftain. It is so important that you do not upgrade your Brian King to that to not break your build. Otherwise, you are going to need to pick Brian King because we need to get the 100% chance to avoid being frozen. Otherwise, we'll continuously freeze ourselves. Make sure you do not miss out on this. If you are playing this build, you might need to get a friend to come carry you through an underground sea really quickly. Then get the point, but this point is basically mandatory to play the build with a Oriaf Send. Until you get the chance to avoid being frozen, do not run Oriaf Send in your build. Otherwise, we're just simply going to be picking up the Soul Gurkhul, as this gives us physical damage reduction, which is really the only thing we really care about. Another good option would be to pick up Soul of Abrath and to upgrade it with the Unaffected by Burning Ground if you're doing any sort of red altars, or to potentially pick up Soul of Shikari, as poisons are sometimes a little bit of a pain in the ass and having some reduced chaos damage taken is always really nice. Next up, I want to talk about the passive tree and how you would put this together at a lower level. Since I do assume a few people are going to end up playing this build at a lower level before they're maybe 90, 95. As I mentioned at the start of this guide, you can play this build as soon as 60, but I really recommend to wait until 70. I'm going to show you the points that are really important on the tree and what you want at a low level before you have enough points to be able to pick up everything later. So first, we're going to be pathing through all the life nodes at the start of the Marauder tree. These are just way too good to pass out on. The important things here are going to be that we pick up Prismatic Skin through the Fire Res node as is going to help us get to 90% all res a lot easier. And very crucially to our build, we need these two nodes right here for 50% increased ignite duration on enemies, as that will also apply to us through the fulcrum, meaning the ignites that are on us are going to be 50% longer, meaning it's going to make the build feel a lot more consistent. Other than that, you're going to want to path all the way up here really quickly and to pick up this jewel socket, which we'll talk about more in, later in the video, to put your elegant hubris in here, which is going to give you supreme ostentation. And this is going to allow you to not care about attribute requirements, which is important because 
because getting dexterity in this build is basically impossible. And it's going to give you a roll of life, which you need to avoid shocks from your Oriaf Send. Then you want to make your way all the way up the side of the tree and make sure you pick up Sovereignty, which is going to allow you to fit all of your auras in. Make sure you pick up Holy Fire, which is going to give you a chance to ignite. And then come over here and pick up Breath of Flames through the right side, which is going to give you more chance to ignite. Deep Thoughts and the Mana Reservation Mastery, which is going to allow you to actually fit everything in. And lastly, Acrimony with the increased skill factoration and duration of ailments on enemies roll as this again will make the ignites on you last longer i would recommend to probably come over here to the templar area and pick up all three of these nodes as these nodes feel really strong as well as coming over here and pick up divine judgment with the 15 percent chance to ignite roll as this with Holy Dominion will get you to 100% chance to ignite, assuming you have a freeze, shock, and ignite during effect roll on your Ruby Flask. After that, I'd maybe recommend going and getting yourself your Cluster Jewels as you are going to need Fan the Flames. So you need to make sure you pick this up before you run out of passive points. And from there, you can add in more Cluster Jewels. You can go back and pick up a few Life Nodes. You can start picking up your Jewel Sockets and eventually fitting in your last Cluster. I wouldn't add this Cluster in until the absolute end of your build as you don't really need another Towering Threat and Assert Dominance. And I'd make sure you pick up everything else first instead. Now, one very important thing I want to mention here is how to actually fit all of your auras in. We're going to be running a Purity of Fire, Malevolence, and Petrified Blood with an Enlighten, as well as a Herald of Ash. Fitting in all this is going to be very simple by using the Mana Reservation Mastery that is with Deep Thoughts, but eventually we are going to craft a helmet with mana reservation efficiency of skills on it. What I want to point out here is that you need to divine this roll to 8%. We're going to be using shrieking essences as we do not need deafening essences. So the roll is going to be 7 to 8%. If you get exactly 8%, you then can drop these three passive points and still have enough mana to turn everything on. If you do not roll this to 8% and only get 7%, then you will need to get yourself a jewel which has mana reservation efficiency of skills on it. But if the helmet roll does end up being 8%, then you do not need this mana reservation efficiency of skills. Again, this is only relevant once you end up doing the helmet craft, but as you're starting this build, you just want to leave three points into deep thoughts and pick up this reservation mastery. But I do want to make you aware that you'll eventually be able to drop those three points once you end up making this helmet or once you end up getting a helmet with mana reservation efficiency of skills on it. Next, let's talk about the Affliction Ascendancy that we want to pick for this build. For this build, we want to be a Primalist, as the Charm Sockets are going to be incredibly powerful for this build. There are going to be some very, very specific rules that we want on here, and there's going to be some very nice to have charms, but we don't really need them, and these can be upgraded later on. First off, we are going to need two charms that have plus one maximum fire resistance on them. You can potentially just get one charm that has plus two maximum fire resistance, but those are a little bit more expensive. If you can, you want to get plus one maximum fire resistance and... The enemies you or your totems kill have a 1% chance to explode dealing 500% of max life as fire damage, as that is effectively a mini version of Hinakora. And ideally, we'd want to get three of these, which gives us 3% additional chance, bring it from five all the way up to 8% chance. But these are going to be very expensive, as I said. So as a starter for this build, all you need is to get yourself two maximum fire resistance roll. And on the third charm, we want to get ourselves 8% of overkill damages leeches life. We are always going to be overkilling things by a large amount due to our explosions. So this means we're always going to have a very large amount of leech going because we are playing petrified blood in this build that means we are never going to go over 50 percent life especially since we're not using a life flask meaning that this leech will never turn off being there immediately for you when you are taking damage now another option here is to potentially get this overkill damage on a that which was taken and if you do that then you are free to put whatever you want on here and you could potentially just get yourself an explode charm instead with nothing else on it but eventually you would ideally want to upgrade all these to also have the main stat that we want plus the explode on it too Another thing you can do in the future is you can get yourself a charm that has plus two maximum fire resistance and the explode roll on it, meaning you don't need plus one on both of these. And that means it would free one of these up for you to get something else on them. Next up, I want to talk about all of the gems that we're going to be running this build. So the first thing to mention is we're going to be running a dual five link setup in our body armor. We're going to be running both fire trap and righteous fire. And these are just simply here to give us a kill to be able to start a whole chain. The reason we're doing a shared five link is because in our weapon, we want to run a five link for mobility. At the end of the day, this is an auto bomber and auto bombers want to go really fast. So in our weapon, we're going to be running a phase run that is linked with a increased duration, efficacy, and life tap, as these are the only good supports on it. And we're going to be running a frost blink in the same setup as well, because it can also benefit from the life tap, allowing us to not need any mana for any of our builds. With that, 
we are then going to put two damage links together in a chest plate. The reason we're doing this is because Righteous Fire, if you really think about it, is effectively a six link for Fire Trap. No matter what, even if we don't care about the RF damage itself, RF still gives us 42% more spell damage, which is substantially more than any other support. So if we just simply look at it in terms of how much damage is benefiting to Fire Trap, it's giving us more damage than any other support, making this an effective six link. Not only that, but RF itself is going to do damage. And when you account for RF's damage, it's giving you substantially more overall damage than any other support would. Not only that, but the four links that we have here for Fire Trap also just so happen to affect Righteous Fire at the same time, making both of these together a really, really good option as we need these to be able to get a kill to start a whole chain. In our helmets, we're going to be running a Purity of Fire, and this has to be a level 21 Purity of Fire to hit the breakpoint at level 23 with a plus two helmet to be able to get an additional maximum fire res out of it. We're also going to be running a Malevolence and a Petrified Blood within the lion to be able to allow us to fit everything in here. Then we're going to be running a Vitality and a Defiance Banner on an Arrogance. Now this is going to reserve about 30% of our life and that's completely okay as we are going to be so tanky and we're going to always be below low life so we don't really care too much how much of our free low life life we are reserving. We're also going to be adding in a Herald of Ash and this is just going to be unlinked by itself somewhere as it's going to give us a little bit more clear and we have the mana to fit it in. And then lastly, we're just simply going to be adding in some really nice utility skills such as a Cast when damage taken in a steel skin and then a cast on death portal now we are not going to really need the cast on death portal this is just here because this build is mostly going to be farming deli mirror and if you kind of die at the end of a map and you have to walk back into the map you're going to be out of the fog and you're going to lose your whole delirium mirror so this at least lets you get back into the map exactly where you were allowing you to continue to delirium mirror now one thing to mention here and i can't put this in path of building because it's not actually in path of building but you want to go and get yourself a vol breach you do not want a normal portal the reason we want a vol breach is because if we ever get stuck in a situation with, without many monsters, we can use the Vault Breach to just summon a Breach that doesn't give us anything other than monsters to kill to get a chance to proc our Hinakora, which will allow us to continue our self-ignite loop in the middle of a map where there's not many monsters. It's not going to come up very often, but it is a nice to have. So make sure you get yourself a Vault Breach instead of a normal portal. Moving on next, let's talk about the gear for this build. So most of the gear in here is going to be unique items with a few rare items in between. The first thing to mention is going to be the weapon that this whole build revolves around, the Fulcrum. The only reason we want this weapon is for the elemental ailments you inflict are reflected onto you. The only important role here, as the Fulcrum has quite a lot of roles, is the damage penetrates 10% of elemental resistances while you are chilled. This rolls from 8 to 10. If you want to buy a slightly nicer Fulcrum, that is the only role you actually care about. The Fulcrums right now are going to be extremely expensive, so realistically just buy the cheapest one and you won't really notice much of a difference. It's just a small min-max you can make later on. Moving on to our helmets, our helmet is going to be a very heavily crafted helmet. Now, for all three of the yellow items in this build, the helmet, the gloves, and the boots, there will be a crafting guide in the notes section on how to make a crafted one but there will also just be a trade link if you just want to find a half decent helmet to get going all the crafting guides are going to cost multiple divs to make but it's going to give you a substantially stronger helmet than the trade link ones but the trade link ones are designed to be somewhere around 100 to a div each for each piece giving a really cheap starter item if you don't want to craft something but as i mentioned if you want a crafting guide if you want to see a visual representation of how to make every other rare items there will be a separate crafting video coming out with this guide that'll be linked in the description below and it will be on my channel as well detailing how to make every single one of these items but the whole point of our helmet is simply to get plus two socketed aoe gems this is how we're going to be able to get our purity of fire all the way up to level 23 which is going to be important for the additional plus one maximum fire res and then other than that this is just simply going to be crafted by getting ourselves a fractured chaos resistance helmet that we're then going to craft with mana reservation efficiency skills essences until we hit life regeneration rate and then we're simply just going to be putting on suffixes cannot be changed as a prefix and then using a veiled chaos orb to try and unveil plus two aoe gems and then at the end of it we're hoping to have an open prefix to craft physical damage of hits taken as fire damage to help us mitigate physical damage as for the implicits we're going to be looking to get area of effect and physical damage taken as elemental damage as these are the only real two good mods now you can either go for physical damage taken as fire cold or lightning but going for fire and cold are going to be better as we're running both a sapphire flask and a ruby flask meaning any sort of damage redirected into those two is going to be dr'd even further moving on next to our chest plate we're going to be using a cloak of flame 
This is by far best in slot for this build. Not only does it give us 40% physical damage taken as fire, which is an incredible stat, but also gives us increased ignite duration on enemies, which is a very important role for this build, as this role allows us to make the ignite that's on us bigger as well as it affects that too, giving us substantially bigger leeway between explosions, making the build feel a little bit more consistent and a little bit easier to play. Try to get yourself as high of an ignite duration role as you can, but don't spend too much money on it. You can also look for a corrupted one with either plus one maximum resistance or reduced damage taken from crit and it's going to be really easy to end up six linking it and I will have a guide in the description below and there's also a guide in the chest section on the notes on how to easily six link a corrupted version of these. Moving on next to gloves, the gloves are going to be the same thing as a helmet. We're going to be looking for a fractured life regeneration rate or fractured life regen per second. It doesn't matter which fracture you get, just buy the cheapest one as fishing for the other suffix is going to be just as easy. So just buy the cheapest fracture between life regen rate and life per second. We're going to be using chaos resistance and V essences to fish for whichever mod you didn't get fractured on the gloves. So in this case, we got fractured life regen rate. So it'd be spamming NV chaos resistance essences until we get tier one life per second. Then we are going to be cleaning our prefixes if we do not have clean prefixes by using Eldritch and Null orbs. And then we'll be crafting flat life on these gloves and then Eldritch exalt orbing until we hit tier three flat life or higher. And then assuming we have an open prefix, we're going to be crafting in damage while leeching because we're always going to be leeching in this build. Lastly, for the Eldritch implicits, we're going to be crafting fire damage over time multiplier and exposure on hit as these are going to be in incredible DPS increases for our explosions, which means we're going to get bigger ignites on ourselves. As for our boots, same thing goes here. You're either going to look for fractured life regeneration rate or fractured life per second. And then we're going to be using chaos resistance essences to fish for the other one. So in this case, we have life regeneration rays or fractures. So we're using chaos res essences to fish for tier one life per second. Then we're going to be cleaning up our prefixes with Eldritch and Null Orbs if we have no open prefixes. And then we're going to be crafting suffixes cannot be changed. And then using a veiled chaos orb to find movement speed. Now, one very important thing here to mention is if you get the unveil for movement speed and 100% chance to avoid being chilled, that is a brick and you cannot accept that as that will ruin your self chilling, meaning you are going to lose a lot of movement speed. Lastly, we're going to be ending the craft with a maximum life roll as there is nothing else we really need for prefixes. Moving on next to the amulet, we are going to be using a defiance of destiny. This is one of the most broken amulets for magic finds, for squishy builds, for petrified blood build, for any sort of build that's kind of half paper to basically become immortal. I have a whole video talking about this amulet in detail and I'll link in the description below. But this amulet, the TLDR of it is that whatever portion of unreserved life you're missing when you get hit, it will immediately heal you for a percentage of that. This means that you want to get a very high roll on that stat on this amulet as it can go up to 36% by default. And you want to make sure you fertile catalyst it as you can fertile catalyst it all the way up to 42%, which is incredibly insane and it makes you substantially tankier. Other than that, we're going to be anointing infused flesh, which is the only real thing we want in this build is it's going to give us another way of regenerating as regenerating is going to make us super tanky. Up next, we have our rings. Our rings are very, very simple. We just want to get ourselves a death rush and a winter weave. The death rush is going to give us adrenaline on kill, which is going to give us a lot of generic damage, which is going to help our explosions. It's going to give us physical damage reduction, which is going to feel great. And it's going to give us 20% movement speed. The only role you care about on death rush is the adrenaline. Do not get adrenaline for one second on kill ring. You want two or three seconds. One second just feels really bad. Ideally, you want three. The life on kill doesn't matter too much. If you can get a max roll of it, that's great. But if you get a minimum roll of the life on kill, that's the same thing. For the winter weave, we honestly just want any winter weave and you're just going to look for high max life roll on it. We don't care about the chaos resistance or any of the fire or cold damage to attacks it gives. We simply just want it for the effect of chill on you is reversed. And if you can ideally find yourself a corrupted one with bleeding cannot be inflicted on you or poison cannot be inflicted on you, that'd also be a really nice defensive layer. But realistically, just look for one with high flat life. Moving on to our belt, we have two options to begin this build with. One, we can either go for Abyssal's Leash, and this is just going to give us access to Rampage, which is going to feel really nice as it'll give us even more movement speed. And because it's so cheap, we can easily find ourselves a Corrupted Biscos that has 12% increased movement speed during any flask effect on it for even more movement speed. There really isn't much we need on a belt, so Biscos is really nice, especially since it gives us a little bit of quant, meaning we get a little bit more magic find. But if you do want a better belt and something a little bit tankier and something that'll all around make your build feel a little bit better, what instead you can go for is a Stygian with some flask stats 
on it. All we need anesthesia would be some max life and some chaos resistance, as well as some flask effectoration and some flask apply to you have increased effect. These are relatively expensive. A belt that looks something like this might cost you somewhere around two to three dev. But this is another good option instead of biscos. But I'd really recommend you just run biscos as biscos will give you more movement speed than this belt will, as well as just making it faster. But if you want an easier way to chaos resistance cap, if you don't want to go for such high chaos resistance rolls on your gear, or if you don't want to look for high chaos resistance roll fracture on your helmet, this would also help you get the remainder of your chaos resistance through the belt. No matter what though, eventually your end game belt is something I'd highly recommend for you to try and farm in this build it would be a head hunter. Head hunter is going to make this build go ballistic. It's going to give you so much more movement speed than you previously had as it'll compound with your increased action speed from your reverse chill. It's going to give you a large amount of extra damage, which is going to make your clear and your chaining of your explosions feel a little bit better. And it's going to make you pretty tanky, which you already were pretty tanky as it was, but head hunter would basically allow you to AFK in almost any situation in almost every map, assuming you had a few head hunter stacks going for you. Moving on next to our flasks, we first have a very important flask. First, I want to talk about Oriaf Send. This is going to be crucial to our build and it's going to give us a large chunk of our movement speed. The important thing here about Oriaf Send is that when an enemy explodes from it, it's either going to do damage as cold, fire, or lightning. The nice thing here is this is effectively a buffer for Hinakura is not working. If Oriaf's procs fire damage, it's still going to give us a small ignite, allowing us to keep clearing without a Hinakura's, hoping we proc another Hinakura's later on in the map. If it procs cold, it's going to chill us, meaning we can use Winter Weave to get a very large increase in movement speed. And the only downside here is if it procs lightning. We will have to completely negate lightning as there is no way for us to turn the lightning into a beneficial role. The way we're going to be doing this is by getting ourselves an Abyss Jewel with chance to avoid being shocked on it. The role doesn't matter. Any role works as we are also going to be including in an Elegant Hubris. And on this Elegant Hubris, we are looking to get ourselves one rule of life point, which is going to give us 80% chance to avoid being shocked. Between these two, this is how you get yourself your shock immunity to not get immediately destroyed by the massive shocks Oriaf Send will apply to you through Fulcrum. And once you do that, you can safely run Oriaf Send this build. The other thing to mention, as I mentioned, the Pantheon section of this guide is you need the 100% chance to avoid being frozen from Soul of the Brian King. Otherwise, every time Oriaf Send crits, you'll just be frozen and not be able to play the game. And then the same goes for the Frostwing that you have. Every time you Frostwing, you'll just freeze yourself and not be able to play the game. This is something you need to get before you start playing the build. I mentioned this in the Pantheon section, but I'll mention it again as this is so important to the build. You do not want to actually Actually capture Nassar and get the 50% reduced effect to chill on you as that will make you lose a lot of movement speed in this build. Next, we have Taste of Hate, and this is just going to be an overall really great flask, and it's going to make us feel a lot more tankier. Not only does it make us take 50% less cold damage, which is going to feel great against a lot of the elemental damage you see in the maps, but it's also going to convert 15% of the physical damage that we take into cold damage. This is going to be great because we can't really fit a lot of armor into our build, meaning that we are going to feel a lot tankier. And if you end up getting a physical damage taken as cold roll on your helmet, Taste of Hate is also going to knock it down a little bit more, making you not really feel that portion of the damage. The only roll we care about here is the physical damage taken from hit as cold damage during effect and the physical is extra cold is irrelevant as we don't do any physical damage in this build. Lastly for our three utility flasks we just have a quicksilver, a granite, and a ruby. The ruby is going to be here to give us a lot more regeneration since it's going to counteract the degen from RF quite heavily as well as help us against any of the physical damage taken as fire. Since we are running a cloak of flame and 40% of the damage we will take will be as fire and we're adding in other various physical damage taken as fire such as on our helmet or on a watcher's eye meaning that the ruby flask is going to do a lot of work in keeping it tanky. As for the prefixes on these I would recommend to get 25% increased effect and as low of a reduced duration roll as you can as these flasks are going to be effectively permanently up given the density of the maps that we want to run this build. And for suffixes, there are going to be three very important suffixes. We want to get ourselves increased movement speed, increased armor, and chance to freeze, shock, and ignite during effect. Now, the armor and movement speed roll can be put either on your quicksilver or your granite. It doesn't matter as they both last the same amount of time. But you really want to make sure the freeze, shock, and ignite roll is on your ruby flask because the ruby flask lasts slightly longer, meaning it will be more consistently up. And we need this roll to be able to hit 100% chance to ignite. Without this roll, it's a little bit awkward to 100% chance to ignite. So we really want to make sure this is up for as long as possible. If this roll is down, that's okay. You still have a 70% chance to ignite and the build's going to work just fine. But with this roll, it's going to make it feel a lot more consistent and there really is no better way for us to get this last 30 percent without wasting a lot of passive points next up i want to talk about the cluster jewels that are in this build as we do have some quite very important cluster jewels first we are going to be running one 
large elemental damage cluster. Now, the important thing here is that we have widespread destruction in Sadist on it. Sadist is going to be great because we're going to always be chilling, igniting, and shocking, meaning we're going to get a lot of elemental damage from it. And widespread destruction is just going to give us a lot of area of effect, and we always like more area of effect to make our explosions bigger. The third node on here has to either be corrosive elements or prismatic heart. If you have a cluster jewel with either of those two notables, that means widespread destruction in Sadist will be on the left and right, giving us the most optimal pathing. If a jewel with either corrosive elements or prismatic heart is too expensive, it's okay and you can get any other notable is just you either have to path over here to get Sidus or widespread destruction, or just simply skip out on it until you get yourself a better large cluster jewel later. For our medium cluster jewels, we're going to be running one burning damage cluster jewel, and this is going to have burning bright and fan the flames. Fan the flames is absolutely critical in this build, as this is how we're going to be spreading the ignite that's inflicted onto us by Fulcrum, and you simply cannot skip out on this jewel. And burning bright is just going to give us some burning damage and some area of effect, making our ignites bigger and making them also hit a a little bit of a bigger area. Then we are also going to be adding in two area damage cluster jewels. These are both going to have towering threat and assert dominance. Assert dominance stacks together, meaning if we have two of these, we get 50% increased area of effect if you've killed five enemies recently, and we're always doing that. And towering threat just gives us some more area of effect in life. We're going to be putting one in the large cluster jewel over there, and we're going to be putting a, a second one over here in the armor cluster jewel node by the middle of the left side of the tree. Lastly, we're going to have one small cluster jewel, and this is just going to have enduring composure on it, as this is going to give us access to endurance charges, which we really want our build given that we're picking up one maximum endurance charge here and one maximum endurance charge here. Next up, I want to talk about the watcher side that we're going to want to run for this build. So the only stat that you really are going to need to start with is going to be the physical damage from hits taking us fire damage while affected by purity of fire. It's going to overall make you tanker. And later on, once you have more money, you can eventually upgrade into a damage over time multiplier while affected by malevolence Whirl. Now, one very crucial thing to mention here is do not get a malevolence watcher's eye that says your ailments deal damage faster. That is going to be a brick for this build as it's going to make the ignite on you tick faster, making your build feel a lot more inconsistent. Only good damage roll is the damage over time multiplier while affected by malevolence. But these two rolls together are going to be quite expensive, so don't really worry too much about it. As long as you have the physical damage taken as fire damage, purity of fire roll, that's all you really need to start this build. Lastly, we have one of the new affliction jewels called that which was taken. The special thing about this jewel is it is a jewel that has four random charm modifiers on it from all of the charms available for Primalist. The only rule that we care about on here and the only rule that's going to be in path of building is going to be plus two maximum fire resistance. There are a lot of rules on this jewel and it's effectively the watcher's eye of charms. And I can't really tell you exactly which one to get, but I'm just going to put the only stats that you actually need on it as the plus two maximum fire res is going to be crucial for us to get to 90, 90, 90 all res. Feel free to do some window shopping and feel free to look at a few of these that are nice. Some good options might be Onslaught and Kill, Nearby Enemies Exposed Have Less Resistance, Phasing on Kill, Increased Flask Effect. There's a lot of different modifiers here that are really nice. The only one you need to be wary about is the chance to avoid ailments roll on it. That is a complete brick as 20% chance to avoid ailments means 20% chance that the ignite from your explosions does not get applied to you, meaning that you might potentially miss out on a big Hina Cora proc. Do not get that roll, but you can get anything else you want on it. Lastly, I want to talk about the Timeless Jewel in this build and how you can find one for this build yourself. So finding this is going to be very simple. So all we care about on this Timeless Jewel is very, very simple. First, we need it to be commemorating Kesprio, as that is going to turn the Keystone into Supreme Ostentation. And this is going to allow us to ignore attribute requirements, meaning we don't need to get 155 decks to actually use Fire Trap. Getting Dexterity in this build is going to be very difficult, and that is going to eat up a lot of the stat budget and the rest of our gear. And because of that, Supreme Ostentation is a no-brainer. The other thing we need is a elegant hubris with a number that turns either of these two nodes into rural life, which is going to give you 80% chance to avoid being shocked. Finding a jewel like this is going to be very simple. First, you want to go into path of building and pick up both of these nodes. These nodes are normally a 30 intelligence and a 30 dexterity node, as well as picking up the jewel socket. Then you're going to click the find timeless jewel button at the bottom path of building. And all we have to do is just very quickly set it up. We're going to pick a elegant hubris. We're going to select Casprio as our conqueror. We're going to click on filter nodes. So it's only going to search the nodes that we have allocated, which is these two nodes right here. And then we simply just want to type in in the search for node section, the node that we're actually looking for. So all we're going to do is we're just going to type in shock and we're going to click on rule life. And it's going to add it into the desired node section. Another thing you can look for is chaos resistance. 
as eyes with open is going to feel really nice to have 30 percent 37% increased chaos resistance. But the problem with this is it's very expensive to find a jewel with these right now due to the popularity of this build. But I do want to make you aware there's also a possibility. No matter what, if you don't want to look for chaos resistance, you can just simply remove it from this filter. And as soon as you have all the nodes that you want to search for, you simply just click search and it's going to show you every single jewel number that is going to be Caspriel that is going to have either of these two nodes be a real life. All you then have to do is just simply click copy trade URL, go over the trade and simply just paste this link. This is then going to show you a list of every single timeless tool that currently has the setup. As you can see here, these are kind of expensive and there might be some other ones for sale that are a little bit cheaper. But if these are too expensive for your taste, all you have to do is just simply come back into Path of Building and click copy next trade URL and it's going to copy the next set down. Then we're just simply going to go back and paste these and see if there's any cheaper ones. As we can see here, there is one that we can buy for a div that would give us exactly what we need. Again, if there weren't any, you can just click copy again. As you can see, there are a lot of different numbers that will potentially give us one rule life on either of those two nodes. The ones at the top are going to have two, but we only need one. If you end up having one that has two, you only need to pick up one of them. But there are a lot of different options. So if they're too expensive, just simply go down to the next ones. And as you can see, here's a few cheaper ones. If you do it again and try again, you'll see there's even more cheaper ones. The further down you go in the list of copy trade next URL, the higher your chance of finding a cheap one as the ones all the way at the top are typically going to be the super expensive ones because people are kind of lazy and they don't really click this button enough to find the obscure numbers towards the bottom that people haven't upcharged because this build is popular yet. But as you can see, there's a lot of numbers. So please don't buy yourself in a very expensive one as you literally have over a thousand different options for this jewel. And that's all there really is to this build guide. I absolutely have fallen in love with this build. I'm so happy I played an ancestor and I'm so happy I'm playing it again. You can expect to see this build in a lot more of my upcoming videos as I plan to do quite a lot of farming strategies with this build as I want to experience it to the absolute fullest. So if you want to see this build tear some content and make some insane money, I will be happy to show you that in the next few upcoming money makers and in the upcoming build guide on how to do this build with Magic Find because this build can be Magic Found. It just has to be changed a little bit to be able to fit in the Magic Find gear, but it is is going to be a pretty solid magic finder. If you have any questions on the build, please feel free to leave a comment in the comments below. I'll try to answer you as soon as I can. I also stream on Twitch every single day. So if you want to come by and ask your questions directly to me, I'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions there. Or if you simply just want to see this build in action, or if you just want to come hang out with all the other cuties, I'll be happy to see you there for that as well. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you cuties in the next video.